Hey everybody, what up? All right, so in this video, what I'm talking about is why you should install and use WSL for Windows, which is a Windows sub subsystem for Linux. Uh, and the reason why is actually I use a Mac, Windows, Linux for a long time, and uh, I really can't stand Windows when it comes to like having to develop on Windows after getting more accustomed to just strictly using a, a, a Mac or a Linux environment. And uh, when I when and the biggest example of something like that is like NVM, right? NVM. I was gonna just quickly say like why you should use Node Version Manager. So you have multiple versions of Node for different projects that require different versions of Node. Kind of similar to how you could have Python two and Python three installed on your machine and, and dealing with that. But in the Node environment, I think that it becomes uh, a lot more important that you're working with Node versions that go back to like version. 14 to like you know 16 18 20 and uh, a lot of projects require that right so it's not even just about virtual environments or anything like that like virtual environment with python or just you know node modules in the package dot uh, json structure and how that all works with the node ecosystem point being when you're dealing with multiple versions you want this tool and this tool if you do a quick search on Windows, it doesn't work, right? So it basically says, hey, you should have WSL if you're going to actually use this. Or you could use Git Bash, but Git Bash doesn't work because there's security concerns and you can bypass some security concerns to install software, but that's typically a bad idea. So even Git Bash isn't working according to this uh, recommendation. And then these three versions, uh, these projects, you know, it's something that you have to install, somebody that figured this out so that you could run some software. And then a lot of times I've, I've found that, you know, installing this shit, it installs like all these different like plugins and, and uh, malware and everything on your machine. And all of that is just typical of a Windows ecosystem, in my opinion. Um, so the best thing to do, I think, is to just simply install WSL and your flavor of uh, Linux so you can actually run uh, software properly. So for an example here, what we're going to do is use PowerShell and you're going to have to run as administrator. So we're going to do that. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to paste in this command and uh, you might want to just pause the screen real quick, but it's dism.exe online enable feature, feature name, Microsoft Windows subsystem, Linux, all no restart. Okay. So it's enabling this feature now. Hopefully it's not going to want me to restart my computer. All right. It doesn't. And it said no restart. So hopefully that's why. Uh, so now we can go ahead and install whatever flavor of Linux that, that you want. So in my case, I use Ubuntu for my server-side stuff for my web development, uh, like CodeHawk and all that is Ubuntu. All right, so now that we've done that, you can now go to the Microsoft Store, and we can actually look for Ubuntu or any other flavor of uh, Linux operating system that you're trying to run. And we're just going to type Ubuntu and see if this works. All right, so there we go. Um, a lot of different versions here. So I'm pretty sure my server is now using 20. Um, so we're going with this one, although is this not free? Another, yeah, again, I could see Windows charging for free software. That would be great. All right, so now that that's installed, what we should be able to do is um, you could search for Ubuntu and you can see that you have it here as an app, uh, or you could actually go to a command line and type uh, WSL and it should automatically fire that up. And uh, now this is going to go ahead and finish the install. And it says that it has not been enabled. So that sucks. Maybe I have to do that from PowerShell. No, that's not what I'm trying to do. So let's try this. Let's type CMD and type WSL. All right, so that, and we're going to just say uh, what, launch. Enable WSL1. Fuck. All right, so I'm going to try to run as administrator again on PowerShell. Run this command. You might need to pause the screen if you're following along. And then we're going to enable WSL2, which has more performance. All right, so it's saying it did that correctly. 
I might need to restart my machine. Uh, I still get that. I probably have to restart the machine, and I'm just guessing at this point. Let's try to run as administrator real quick. No, same thing. All right, so now with Windows, we have to do the good old computer restart. All right, so I just did the painful process of restarting, and we're going to try this again. No, so we get the same error. That's uh, that's beautiful. Actually, no, this is a different error. WSL2 requires an update from its kernel component. All right, let's try to run PowerShell again. And I'm going to make sure I don't get any errors on that. It's saying it's enabling it. All right. And we're enabling the virtual machine platform with this. It would be nice to know if it actually worked before or whatever. Can I set the default here? Uh, it said completed. Okay. Now we still get that issue. Uh, for Linux, no install distributions. Interesting. We had already done that, I thought. So now we're going to Windows official documentation. I shouldn't need this. So it's already working. Okay, WSS. I could just do it. WSL install. Like to see a list of all the available. Okay, so we can run this command. Okay, so I guess whatever I did for the App Store was not a good idea, and I probably should un uninstall whatever it did. Um, We're going to go with 20.04. All right, so let's type WSL, install the actual distro, Ubuntu 20.04. Probably should have done it this way from jump, but and it looks like uh, no matter what I do, this now has popped up and it's doing the same thing. All right, so we're going to this uh, Windows documentation to download the latest Linux kernel update for 64 machines. All right, so that's now finished. So let's try to run this. It's getting a little further, it looks like. All right, so now finally we get to um, set up our username. So I'm going to go ahead and pause the screen so I can set this up. All right, so I'm getting um, some sort of message here that there's an error to run uh, this command. Uh, so Python scripts error. All right, so what's interesting is I actually now have two versions of Ubuntu. I have the one that I installed from the App Store, and then I have uh, this 20.04 that I did from the command line. I just set up, I believe, the account yeah for the uh, 20.04. Maybe. All right, so either way, now I have two versions of Ubuntu. 
um, 20 and 22. And both of them probably need to get an update. So I'll just say sudo apt update. And then we'll do upgrade. Upgrade. Oh, it's just sudo apt upgrade update. No, this one don't this one don't work at all. Alright, whatever, this one don't work at all from the PowerShell. Just use the one from the app store. All right, so now you have a Windows subsystem installed on Windows. So if you wanted to actually do something on Ubuntu, everybody's using Ubuntu or whatever, your server on Linode is Ubuntu, you could create and manage your entire project via this command terminal. So like curl would work, right? Um, this obviously isn't a, a full curl command, but you could do something like that. You could run something like nano test.tx, or there's a TS TypeScript file, but that, that gives you the nano editor. Uh, basically, everything you're familiar with the git bash, uh, not git bash, but the bash or terminal within a, a uh, Linux subsystem or Unix uh, system. All right, so um, there's also this bridge between files that are on your Linux subsystem and Windows. And if you want to access them, you're going to do something like uh, cd mnt c. And then like if you have like a projects folder like I do, I can go into my tutorials folder and I can get that that does not exist. Um, uh, that's because I'm already in the C. Duh. So anyway, um, you're always just going to say once you're in like you're mounted to C drive, uh, you can go ahead and navigate into your folders. And I don't need the forward slash there. Man, I'm struggling. Uh, so now I'm in my tutorials folder. So if I were going to go ahead and like um, create a folder for a project and we'll just say like uh, node. That's a bad name. Uh, let's just say uh, hello node. And then I can now CD into that. And so now what you can do is you can actually just use your normal like Visual Studio Code. You can open up that folder. So you can see now that I have uh, Visual Studio Code open, I have this uh, Windows WSL pop-up that's uh, asking me to install. So I'm going to go ahead and install that. And then let's say don't show that again. Uh, but WSL is a package for Visual Studio Code. You can see that there's 23 million downloads. So we're installing that. It's already installed. But you can now open your folder and go into this project, right? So we had like uh, whatever files we want to create in this uh, this folder here. So bottom line is that Windows can communicate with files that you're creating on your Windows subsystem or vice versa. So yeah, anyway, this entire video is actually prompted because I was trying to install Node, Node Version Manager and I realized that Windows just doesn't cooperate very well. So I was like, oh, I might as well get through WSL. And if I'm going to go through that, I'll go ahead and create a video about it. Trying to get back in the game, been a while, really rusty. Uh, but let me know what you guys think. Uh, do you use this? Uh, what do you think? Do you hate Windows? Like, comment, subscribe. I appreciate it. Everybody have a good night. Talk to you later. Bye. If you're learning to code, I recommend you check out my website, CodeHawk.com. My courses are fast to the point without the fluff that you'll find on other competitor sites like Pluralsight and Udemy. One of the reasons why you'll want to learn with me is that I'm a self-taught engineer myself. I never went to school for any of this stuff. I've been doing it for over a decade now professionally. The biggest reason you should use CodeHawk is that it's one price for everything. I try to make this as affordable as possible. Instead of having to purchase 15 to 20 different courses on Udemy or an expensive monthly subscription to Pluralsight, it's one price for everything on CodeHawk. Front end, back end, 
full stack. It has courses on all the latest web development technology. The courses range from beginner to advanced. So if you want to learn the latest web technology, give CodeHawk a look. There's demos for all of the courses that are out there right now. Uh, in addition, there's also my personal vlogs, which I'll be adding more to. So content that I don't release to YouTube is available on CodeHawk.